Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Herod, the ruler, heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put John to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guest, he commanded it be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who brought it to her mother. John's disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's a hard story to say thank you for, isn't it? To imagine John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus and the fate that he met. Because there was a woman who could not stand that she had been corrected by him speaking truth to power. John the Baptist, as a prophet, had told Herod who was serving as a ruler on behalf of the Roman government, and his now wife, Herodias, that their marriage was not in keeping with the the Jewish laws. Herod was the son of Herod the Great, the one who was king when Jesus was born. The family tree gets complicated because Herod had ten wives. So that's lots of kids, and he liked naming them after him. So there were lots and lots of Herods in the family going down through the generations. So this is one of Herod's sons, Herod Antipas, who's the one in this story, who calls for the beheading of John. And he has married Herodias, who also springs from this line. This is his niece and also was his half-brother's wife before it was his wife. So if you thought you had family dysfunction to face as you gather for the holiday... Rest assured, there is more in here. So this is Herod Antipas, one of Herod the Great's sons, and he has married now his niece, who was his brother's wife. And he did not wait for his brother to die. That would have been keeping with some of the Leverite customs. They just decided they wanted to be married, so Herod Philip was out of luck. Um, Herod and Herodias both divorced their spouses before, and and then came together as a couple. And so John says, this is not the way of the people of God. That doesn't seem like a really strong, surprising statement, right? But nobody who's royal wants their prerogatives questioned. Nobody wants their power um, questioned. And that's what he's doing. You can't rule for God if you're going to live this way. If you're going to ignore who it is God calls us to be, then you are no ruler of the people of God. This is John's word to them. And, and Herod seems to let John the Baptist's denouncement of them go in a way that his wife, his second wife, does not. Herodias holds a grudge, we're told. This, this story about the beheading of John the Baptist that we've read here today from Matthew is also in the Gospel of Mark. And in Mark's Gospel, which was written first, Herod seems more sympathetic about John the Baptist. He He is intrigued by him. He knows that he's a charismatic leader, and he knows that he does speak truth. He is aware of his innocence. But Herodias, I'm sure, was ridiculed in a different way as a woman than King Herod would have been by the gossip about the choice she had made and the marriage she was a part of, and she would not let it go. In fact, in Mark's gospel, we're told that Herod actually arrested and imprisoned John to keep his wife from killing her. So that's a different twist in Mark than we have 
and Matthew. But regardless, John is arrested, John is in prison. It could be considered treason to question the actions of the king. And when Herod divorced his first wife to marry Herodias, it was a princess in a neighboring kingdom. And so eventually, in fact, that leads to a war that destroys most of King Herod's troops. And many saw that as a just consequence um, doled out by God because Herod beheaded John. So there is a lot of intrigue going on in this story. And John the Baptist could have been seen as, as really siding with the neighboring kingdom who was upset and jilted that their princess had been cast off because Herod decided he wanted to marry another. And so in the story in Matthew, we're told that Herod did want John dead, just like his wife did, that the only thing that stopped him was the crowd's respect for John the Baptist, that they viewed him so highly as a prophet that he was afraid to upset them. After all, Herod didn't have the power of his father, Herod the Great. He's just a Roman governor, essentially, a go-between between between the Jewish people and the Romans who rule over them. And so his position and his power is on thin ice always. He has a delicate line to walk. And so he doesn't want to upset them. But then Herod's birthday comes and he has a great celebration And strangely enough, um, Herodias' daughter comes and dances for him and for his guests. This would not normally be considered appropriate either, but given the family history I have already gone through about this family, that doesn't surprise us too much, right, that the birthday celebration might get a little raucous. But I want to be clear here. You know, this story is rarely preached, and you can see why. Um, I can feel why as I'm tempted to blush telling you this story um, standing before you today. But it certainly fits in the bad guys of the Bible series, if you ask me. Um, but, but our imagination about this story can really be colored by works of art that have come since the Scripture, since this was written. Oscar Wilde has a very very prominent play um, called Salome, and Herodias's daughter's not named here in the scripture for us, but that's the the name she's given in the play, and then we have a Strauss opera that also goes by that name, and in it, both Herodias and her daughter are seen as very seductive tricksters, Um, and, and Herod comes off as this old lecherous guy who not only um, casts off his first wife, the princess from the neighboring kingdom, to marry his brother's wife, but now has eyes and desire for his stepdaughter. It really just can't seem to stop getting worse, this story. But I want to be clear that those are works of fiction. While those may um, paint the story, what we have in scripture doesn't tell us what kind of dance it was, simply that it pleased Herod, and perhaps it was not um, what we think it would be. Um, So we have to be careful, as powerful as those depictions are, that we don't give them more weight than we would the scripture itself and understanding what happened. What we do know is that she danced and that it pleased Herod, and so he promised her on oath to give her whatever she wanted. These are dangerous oaths to make. Um, Powerful people could have learned from other Bible stories not to do such things. Um, But apparently they are slow to learn, as are many of us. And so he makes this promise. Clearly, this daughter is close to her mother because she could have asked for whatever she wanted from Herod. But she goes and asks her mother what it is she should ask for. And finally, for Herodias, who has had this grudge, who has wanted John dead for so long, for whom it is not enough that he languishes in prison, she sees her opportunity for her grudge to be enacted, for her revenge to be complete. And so her daughter then, at the prompting of her mother, asks for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So clearly, these women are usually the ones in this story who are seen as the most vile, often painted as seductresses, 
often painted as using their sensuality then to manipulate powerful men. But I do want to clarify here, not that I can come to the defense of Herodias or the daughter or anyone in this family for that matter, but we don't know all of the facts, and we do know that Herodias did not have that much power. She had grown up in a palace because because of her family lineage. She had watched her family do horrible things, violent things, to keep power. So this was part of what she had been taught um, in her family system. And she could not have had John beheaded on her own. The best she could do as a woman is influence her husband. That seems to have helped lead to John's arrest, perhaps, but he still has his head until this birthday party. And most of the time, she would just have to suffer in silence because she is someone to be paraded around at her husband's side when he desires it, but she doesn't have real power. It's probably part of why she would hold the grudge so long, probably why the court gossip wounded her so deeply, and she wants her daughter to avenge her while there's a rare opportunity to do so. Again, a vile scene, a vile request, but it is not truly Herodias who can be ultimately blamed and held solely responsible for the beheading of John the Baptist. There are three players here, both Herodias and her daughter who dances and is willing to make the request, and Herod who grants it. Because yes, he's made an oath, a foolish oath, probably prompted by drunkenness that he never should have made in the first place. But he could have still gone back on his word. He still had power. He could have spoken to his stepdaughter. He could have said, ha ha, that's funny. What do you really want? But perhaps even though the scripture tells us that Herod was grieved, he did still see John as a threat to his power and his rule. And so part of him seemed to want John dead. We're told that earlier in this passage in Matthew. So Herod is still the one who has the power to send his guards to take this vile action in the first place. The blame can be shared in this dysfunctional family. And John, the innocent one, loses his head in the end. His disciples are brave, those who followed him, and they come and take the body, and then they go and tell Jesus. This is the only story that you will find in the gospel that does not directly speak to Jesus and his ministry, Jesus and his life, but it prefigures this clash of powers between the kingdom of God and those who would work against it. You could categorize them as kingdoms of this world, but clearly Herod is more anti what God would have than perhaps most. There is a clash of kingdoms coming, and John, who is the forerunner for Jesus, runs afoul of this power, and we know in time Jesus will as well to speak on behalf of of the people of God, to speak for God's justice, to offer accountability sometimes means you are in a precarious place. That is true for John, and that will become true for Jesus as well. And yet this scripture begs the question of what kingdom are we most loyal? Where do our loyalties lie? Will we be part of the kingdom of God? Will we speak up and speak truth to power? Will we stand up for justice and what is right, even knowing that the threat to us, if we do so, is real? For John, the answer was yes. For Jesus, it would be as well. For us, often it is harder. We want to have a foot in both worlds. And yet our psalm that we use for our call to worship and throughout scripture, we are reminded that in this kingdom clash, only one will be victorious in the end. What does it mean to consider ourselves on this Independence Day citizens 
of the kingdom of God. What truth does that mean needs to cross our lips? What uncomfortable decisions are we prone to make to want to shore up our own power to be beyond reproach? How do we continue to live out our citizenship, both in this country and in the kingdom of God, with faithfulness and ways that bring glory to God? These are real questions, and here we have the counterexamples of who not to emulate, and yet to follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist and then Jesus is not an easy call either. May God give us strength, and may we find that strength as we come together to the Lord's table. Amen.